So today we're going to learn about blintzes. And so, how I propose for Hanukkah. Yes. Don't ask. So, last week we spoke about how halacha defines bread products. Bread products refer to something made from the five grains, namely wheat, oats, spelt rye or barley, that are turned into a dough. The ground up into a flour, then further turned into a dough substance. So, for example, if I take a stalk of wheat and I bake it as a snack, it's not considered to be pasta, it's not considered to be bread. But once I turn into a flour and I bake and I turn into a dough and I bake it, it becomes bread. Now, what about blintzes? We have uh, potato blintzes, we have cherry blintzes, we have cheese blintzes, all kinds of wonderful delicacies. And other things that are made from a liquid batter. A blintz is, is typically made from a liquid batter that gets poured onto a frying pan with a little bit of oil, right? And then you, you make the crepe and you flip it over and uh, presto, you're all set to go. So, he says here that something that's, that's fried, that's a liquid batter, that's not considered lechem, that's not considered to be bread. It goes out. The category of bread. We're going to have six potato blintzes or six cheese blintzes. I'm going to have a whole meal. It's not considered to be bread. You might have a stomachache after. There's another story. That, that's not no longer in the category of past. That's a question of bishalakum. Does it have to be? prepared with the participation of a Jew, etc. It's a different category in Allah. Okay? Even if it's made through a, a baker, it would be also because it's no longer in the category of pas. We don't have the heter of pas palter. And remember we said a few weeks earlier that in the category of pas, you have certain leniencies, namely that if it's made by a non-Jewish baker, if you live in a place where you can't get pas Yisrael, it's permissible, but by, by not by bishal akum, there's no permissibility. Something that has to be made bishal Yisrael with the participation of the Jew, if it's not made that way, it's not kosher to eat. So it's more strict. It has a strict side to it. So if we're saying it's not in the category of pas, and if it was made by a non-Jewish manufacturer, yes, it's a problem. It could be not kosher. <laughs> However, if it's baked on a pan without any oil, <clears throat> or just just shemen, if there's just a tiny bit of oil in order that it shouldn't burn, then it does have the din of pas. So now we're just, we're giving a very, very interesting distinction over here. We're saying something that's deep fried with a whole bath of oil, that's considered to be cooked. It's not in the category of pas. If it's, but on the other hand, if I just have a tiny bit of oil or no oil at all, yes, it's still going to be considered pas. So if on the other hand, donuts, which are made from a thick batter, not a liquid batter, a thick, an actual dough batter. That's how most, most donuts are made today. Dina and kipas, they still have the category of pas. Afshin is mashal b'shemen, even though they are cooked in oil because they're a thick batter. So just to recap, this is a bit of a, a tricky kind of halacha. We said when it, comes to, when it comes to liquid batters, we said if the liquid batter has no oil, it has the din of pas. Little, no oil or just a tiny bit of oil, so it shouldn't burn, has the din of as a din of pas, if it has a lot of oil, like it's deep fried, and it's only a liquid batter, as a din of bishel. And on the other hand, when it comes to donuts, so we have a nice orchestra here, it comes to donuts that are a thick batter, yes, those are in the, the category of pas, because it's a thick batter. What about macaroni? I now go to halacha tezvav. I'm just going to digress for a moment. Uh, I can't help it, but I was I was in a factory making a special kosher production of macaroni about 15 years ago, maybe 20 years ago. When I first started in Kashrut, I've been mean, Kashrut for more than 25 years, uh, about 25 years, about 20, 21 years ago. I was I used to do productions. I got up at four o'clock in the morning, maybe even three thirty. I had to be in South Jersey like at five a.m. five five thirty. <clears throat> factory where they're producing these macaroni products and 
we made macaroni. We used to make, we made ravioli actually. We used to stuff them with cheese, but they also made the macaroni on premises. I remember them actually making the process. And I remember talking to some of the, the workers on the production line, and we got to, got to spend like a few days together to tell me about their the cost of living where they lived. They lived like in a small little town in Jersey. Oh yeah, Rabbi, you know, think of myself, wow, what a different life they have over there. <laughs> it's very interesting. But anyway, I saw macaroni being made. It's um, made into a, a dough substance and it's cooked. So macaroni is a cooked product and then it gets dried. When you buy macaroni in the store, it's been cooked and it's dried and then you're just basically re, you're rehydrating essentially. Fresh macaroni, fresh pasta does not have a long shelf life because the, the water content in it was going to make it basically uh, make it spoil this time. It's only gonna, I think it's only fresh for a few days, maybe 10 days in the fridge. But dried pasta is fresh for a long time. It can, can last for years because there's no water, there's nothing to it, because there's no bacteria. So suga itrio, different types of pasta, macaroni, couscous, farfel, all these are different, um, the same kind of family of foods. <laughs> they're made in a factory. There's no problem with pasta and bishalakum. Since they're not edible yet, without further cooking. That's a very, very significant benchmark. If something is not edible without further cooking, the Imbishlam Yisrael Mutarim. So then, therefore, the net result is when a Jew does finish off the cooking, they make it pass or Bishlam Yisrael as applicable. Because again, just to remind us, the whole Takana, the whole rabbinic ordinance is that a Jew must be involved in the actual baking or cooking process. So if it's not fully edible yet, it's not fully cooked or baked, and the Jew finishes off the cooking or baking process, then they're involved. We're good to go. And now we're going to give a, um, a summary. <laughs> what comes out of everything that we studied, I'm just speaking in uh, general terms here, <laughs> bread baked by a non-Jew would be not permissible, would be forbidden in the following scenarios. <laughs> if it's made by a, a non-Jewish neighbor, under most circumstances, under most circumstances. <laughs> so you're, or if it's made by a non-Jewish baker, but pas Yisrael is available, same you know, cost, it's affordable, etc. Then you have no heter. <laughs> or pas palter, for those, meaning the chassidim, and those of follow Pikabala, that they're stringent only to eat, consume pas Yisrael, then again, only, they should only have pas Yisrael products. In a bread that you're never going to come to actually make hamotzi on. For example, the case of my favorite blintzes that are made without any oil. Excuse me, they're made with oil. They're deep fried in oil. You can eat a, a three tons of them. You're not going to come to make hamotzi. Then, Indian, Indian, Kapas, Vishla, Yisra, Bishalak, then be a Shaila, Bishalak, has to be. Actually, a Jew has to be involved in the fire, turning on the fire to make it Bishul Yisrael. I feel enough say they that even if it's made through a, a, a non-Jewish baker or manufacturer, you still have to have a Jew involved because it's no longer in the category of pas. We don't have the heter of pas palter. We now go to the family of Bishul, which has a stringency about it. There's no heter for something that's that would be served at the king's table, that's of a royal nature, not edible raw. It has to be cooked with the Jew's participation. There's no exceptions. Because that law took on the full strength of the law at the time of the enactment. It brought down the, it's brought down the modern way desire. Now, any questions on that so far? Yes. Yeah, what is that? Is there a, a specific ratio or percentage uh, to determine if a batter is liquid or thick to liquidy? Or thick? A, a batter that you pour is considered a liquid batter. A batter that's, sticks that's, that sticks to itself, that you put on the table would hold its own, is considered to be a thick batter. It's like pancake batter is liquid. It's liquid, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes, a lot of blintz batter is also liquid. Yeah. Yeah. Now, halacha yudzayin is, is, a, is a lot of fun because it's talking about, okay, fine, we got all the laws, we got the enactment, we have the whole, you know, you laid out the foundation for us. Great. How, does, how do we actually effectuate how do we actually make a product pass Yisrael now? 
What must be done? So this is called Shit of Yisrobafia. The Jews' involvement in the actual baking process that would then qualify and make the product to be Pas Yisrob. As we're going to see in a moment, that the rabbis didn't make it difficult for us. They said a Jew has to be involved in a significant way. Not a lot of time, but the act that they do shouldn't just be like, oh, I gave it the office. You know, I'm a hard, a Jew in my heart. No, no. We actually involved. We're doing something significant. We're involved in the baking process. And as we're going to see in a moment, that could that could just mean I turned on the fire of the oven, turned on the, the knob, yes. Or I put the bread in the oven. I opened the oven door and I closed the oven door. I contributed to the actual heat, to the baking process. It's not enough that I went to, to stop and shop or I went to Trader Joe's and I bought the ingredients. No, no, no. Very nice. Beautiful. That doesn't qualify. You actually have to be involved in the actual baking process to make the product pass his fault. Let's look inside. Pass palter is not permissible if the non-Jew, did, only in the case where the non-Jew did the entire, yes, the entire baking process from A to Z. If the Jew did one of the first, the, the three parts of the baking, so the time that the Jew actually lit, lit the fire. The time put the bread into the oven. Stirred the coals. Then the bread is no longer considered to be pasakum. So by a Jew lighting the fire, that act qualifies the bread and makes the bread, actually makes a spiritual change in the bread. It makes it pas Yisrael. By the way, this is, spiritually speaking, this is an example of one little act that we do can have a cataclysmic effect on the world around us. You go to a factory, you light, you just raise the flame of a huge oven that's baking 250,000 bagels for the whole, you know, country or whatever, half the country, quarter of the country every day. That one act is going to make all that bread, all that pass, all the pass you throw, all the bagels pass you throw. So it's just, it's just a... I would say it's a shot of chizuk in the arm, so to speak. Yes, one one positive act that we do can have far-reaching effects. Is a story I told my kids last night. I'll just it comes in over here. I can't. It's my nature. I can't help it. But there were there were bachim that went on merkush lichas in the 1950s. They went to some outlying communities and they they felt they went around. They were looking for yidden to be to inspire them, etc. <laughs> and they they didn't find anybody. And they came back feeling a little dejected maybe a lot dejected. They felt like what, what their, all their effort was a waste of time. And they never said, just the fact that you see a Jew walking around proud like a Jew in the yarmulke, sits his a beard. You don't even know what kind of effect you have on the world around you. And it turns out there was a Jew who saw them from the window. And as a result of seeing Yidin, see them walking around as proud Jews, had his soiridus, was awakened. The Jewish spark was awakened and it brought them closer to Judaism. So our, our, our actions have far-reaching effects and we should never quite, never doubt it. And we should really reflect on that for a moment about to see how precious every positive act that we do is. Okay, now, the rabbis were even more lenient with regards to Pasakum Shafilayasalakam Neelu, even if the Jew didn't actually light the oven or put the bread in the oven, this is going to be my twig, my make believe twig. I threw the twig, or I put it inside the oven itself. I got a bonfire, I put, I threw, put a, t- a twig inside. That insertion of the twig itself is enough to make it past your stroke. Or you should not fuck by If you blow the fire, which is going to actually make the fire get stronger, or you open the door and close the door, it's again an act of trapping the heat. As I hitched a pass on Ephesus, then all the bread baked through that additional heat is going to be considered to be past his soul. Shekola Sofas eight and if he has any addition of, of actual fire, of wood, a blowing of the heat. May see for Mat Bechamimus, it adds in the heat of Aish, whom a Karevis is Gmanafia. Actually, it ushers in. The, the the baking process it makes it even quicker so you're actually doing something that's considered a significant act of baking. We turn to page Tamach Beis. Some say that this idea of throwing in a twig is a, is a leniency we should only do when we have no other choices. It's not Plan A. It's only Plan B. Meaning, if a person has all the choices in front of them, they should either turn on the oven, put the bread in the oven, or actually close the door or blow the coals. You remember the story I told you about the Rav who went to a bakery smoking a cigar, yes? Remember the story? 
That was an example of a kisim. He was taking the cigar, which is like a twig. He lit the fire and he threw the, the cigar into the fire as, as an act of contributing towards the baking process to make it possible. Allah Yudches is a, is a very fascinating discussion and I want to just pause and reflect on it for a moment. Okay, so we said, let, let's, let's uh, kind of tie this all together. Let's unpack this. We said that if a Jew is involved in the baking process in a significant way, they're going to make the bread pas Yisrael. What qualifies? Turning on the fire, putting the bread in the oven, trapping the fire, heating or blowing on the fire just to add more heat. Those are all valid contributions to make something pas Yisrael. And we said, if you have no choice and you just put in a little twig, like my, my beautiful pencil over here, that's it, yeah, you put that in, it's also considered to be enough if you have no other choices. And now we're going to discuss a case. What about if the bread is basically, if I, if I, if I buy bread and it's not made past Yisrael and then I put it back into the oven, can I still make it past Yisrael once it's already baked? Or the eggs put in by a Jew? Talking about in the bread? Yeah. No. The leniency with the eggs is, even though you're right, eggs have to be Bishal Yisrael, but the eggs is just a very thin layer and it's considered to be like nullified in the bread itself. Excellent question though, thank you for asking that. Um, so if the bread was already made, can I then change its status? Or if it's not fully baked, can I change its status? At what point, do we, what's the cutoff point? When do we say, okay, it already has its identity, right? We say labeling is disabling. And Allah, once something has already a, an identity, it's not so simple to shake that identity off. So at what point does Allah say, okay, this bread is not Pas Yisrael, or this bread is Pas Yisrael, right? When do we actually make that definition? So we get into a whole discussion. <clears throat> okay, when is bread considered to be ready? What does ready mean? Our Jews can pontificate about this for years. It's great. So I can go to the store. I go to my favorite baker. I can buy a loaf of rye bread. But I happen to like, when I eat my breakfast, I like to toast my bread. But my family, my other family members know they eat it straight, straight out of the bag. It's fresh bread, it's delicious. So I don't need I don't need any toasting. So that becomes a preference. Does my preference qualify as an act of actually making it pasty roll if the bread was not pasty roll beforehand? Was the bread ready to eat? So we get into all discussion. So as we're gonna learn in a moment, if bread is ready to eat and you'd serve it to your guests the way it is, it's really considered to be ready. The fact that you're gonna toast it, that's very nice. You might even decide to, to do all kinds of creative things with it. That doesn't, that doesn't change its status. Its status has been set. What about if I buy bread that's par-baked? Or I buy a, a baguette from our favorite baking company. And it's, it's a little whitish in its complexion. And it's kind of doughy. And it needs about another, let's say, eight minutes in the oven to make it ready to eat. That's a different story. That's not like toasting. Because there, I'm actually doing something. I'm doing a significant act of making the bread ready to eat, of, of making it ready to eat, yes? Making it ready to And then I can make it pasty sauce. So when you buy a bread product that's kosher power, reliably certified, but it's underbaked deliberately, <clears throat> that's a wonderful gift <clears throat> for the pasty soil community because we can buy those products, put them in our oven, and bake, finish off the baking process, and we're good to go. So you can buy par-baked bagels, you can buy par-baked baguettes, you can even buy some par-baked breads. And even some par-baked, uh, I don't know, pizza crusts, right? If they're underbaked and you're going to finish off the baking, that is enough. Let's look at this inside. Afiyah noisefes. Kederech sheish tatvis yisor ba'afiyah, just like a Jew's involved in the baking, ma'ila lahachshar sapas, helps to make the bread ready. Betchilas afiyah, the beginning of the baking, or in the middle, kachim ma'ila b'yisef, it also helps at the end, which means to say that before the bread is ready to eat, even if it's at the tail end, the bread is now 85% baked, or 90% baked. I've been to some very large commercial bakeries. I've discussed this with, with large bakers. Yeah, some, some par-baked breads are 90% ready, but they're still not finished. It still helps for a Jew to finish off the baking process if it's underbaked. The fika chamafa nachli possible yishtat kisiso if a non-Jew baked bread without a Jew's involvement. I feel the nigmar for yosef really kvar lachila. We come up and we mashpich a pass. I feel the sefz yachal yisol achshir deichet aydi chatichas agacholim. If you buy a par baked bread, for example, it's ninety percent baked. 
you take out the baguette from the bag, it's whitish in complexion, it's a little chewy, it's edible. Like if you're really stuck, if you're in a, in a terrible rush and you, you can eat it, you'll survive. But it's not designed to eat that way. Then it still helps for a Jew to make it past his throne. But if something is already fully baked and designed to eat the way it is, then there's no longer an aid set to make it past his throne. If the bread's already edible entirely, it's not going to get any more, like Mishtabach is not going to be more uh, enhanced, so to speak, with further baking. You can no longer make it permissible because its status has already been set. Let's say, for example, you took this bread and you broke it apart. And you made a challah kugel out of it, or you, you put it into another food. It no longer becomes permissible material because once its status already has been set as pasakum, the isra doesn't go away through bishul. Again, like I said earlier, labeling is disabling. Once it already has the status of something in Allah, doesn't lose its status unless it becomes nullified. You can't see it anymore, but status is still there. Any questions on what I said so far? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, it's, a, it's a liquid liquid batter, and yeah. it's like say a, a waffle, okay? And then so the waffle's already been cooked, and then it's frozen. So the, the kid just has to take the waffle out and then toast it. Okay, they can't change its elevation state, or can they? It was a liquid, not a bread, but a liquid. Batter originally. It was a liquid batter. It was and fried it was in oil. It was cooked or cooked? Like a, I don't know, like waffles. Well, waffles frozen. are made with, uh, it's really cooked, right? They cook them and then they freeze if them. If it's cooked, then it, it would be a Shaila Bishalakam. It happens to be that waffles are not considered to be a Lashulcham Malacham. They're not considered to be a Chasha food. It's mm -hmm. more of a like a cheaper type of food, right. not, not a fancy food, and so therefore wouldn't of, require Bishal Yisrael. Yeah. If someone wants to make a bishri yisrael as an added stringency, that's beautiful, but it's not a requirement. Halacha chaf. Din bitl gavi pasakum. Okay, now, just two other halachas before we wrap this up. We have a klal. And we say, hey mamr vahey mamr, which means, in, in English, the same rabbis that these rabbis said, these rabbis said, which means, which means to say, the same rabbis that said, these are the laws, this is the enactment, this is the policy that I'm putting in place. This is the actual prohibition, whatever it is. They also said that there are certain cases when we're not gonna, we're not concerned about, or certain principles. They didn't just say they didn't make uh, blanket statements with no sense of boundary. They said this is a problem within this, under this kind of guise, under this kind of category. But if it's beyond that category, it's a different category. Maybe it's not an issue. So what does that mean? So they also said that if you normally, when it comes to the laws of bittel, bittel refers to something that's being nullified. We say under, under most Yisurim in the Torah and Halacha are nullified in a ratio of one in 60. But with regards to Pasako and Bishalakim, since there are a rabbinic prohibition and the rabbis set the, the parameters and the rules, in many cases they said that with regarding Pas and Bishalakim, if they get nullified in other foods, yes, and they're no longer discernible and you can't see them anymore, we're going to say that they get nullified in the majority which is a much bigger leniency. So you don't have to have 60 times the amount to make it nullified. We're saying even if you have the majority. So if you have 67% of the, of the material that doesn't have to be Bishal Yisrael, and I have material that has to be Bishal, that's Bishal Akum, it's mixed into a food and it gets pureed, I can't see it anymore. It would be kosher to eat after the fact. You're not allowed to try that at home. You're not supposed to do the chatchila, but if it was done, it's done. For example, I'll give you an example. I'm making vegetable soup. It's winter time outside. We need soup to warm ourselves. Yes, okay. Fair. So we have carrots, celery, water, spices, yes. Carrots and celery are edible raw, so they don't have to be bishop. So. And the majority of the ingredients, 60, let's say 70% of the ingredients are all raw. To be raw, I got the water, I got my spices, and I got my calories, my, my calories, my, my celery, my carrots. Okay, wonderful. And then I put in 30% of potatoes. Potatoes have to be visually strong. I put them inside, they get cooked, and I forgot to turn on the fire, and Andrew turns on the fire. Um, and the whole thing gets pureed. Or it was, it was pureed before, it's called, it gets all pureed. 
as one big puree mush, you can no longer see any potatoes. So we're saying there that with regards to the laws of Bishal Akum, there are leniencies that any thing that gets mixed in by mistake, not to try it at home on, on purpose, but my mistake would be nullified in the majority, which is a leniency, because ordinarily we say you need to have 60 times the amount. You, know, you have a tiny drop falling in to a greater mass, fine, but you have so much known. But here we see, yes, so let's look inside. Since the rabbis were lenient with regards to Pasakim, Pasakim, if, if Pasakim falls into another food, it's nullified in the majority. Whether it's, it's, it's mixed into its own kind, or it's not, not its own kind, whether it's in a dry food or a liquid food, even though in other rabbinic prohibitions, you need 60 times to nullify, as I just said, on the bottom of page, Samach Bey is going to Samach Kimmel. The pass of Bishalakum, the rabbis were leaned with regards to pass of Bishalakum, calls the number Imena pass Nikeres. The laws of Bittal, of nullification, are only provided that you can no longer discern the thing that's becoming nullified. If you see it, you can't say nullification, it's there. That's why I said if the soup is pureed, then you can no longer see the potatoes, it could be nullified. But if you see the cubes of potatoes floating around doing the backstroke, you, got it, it, it's, you can't say it's nullified, it's right there. Yes? <laughs> But if, there, if, there, if the pieces are discernible, we don't say bitl then. Okay, halacha chaf alif, ain't yisra pas akum el be pas be en. Fine. The yisra pas akum, a bread baked by a non Jew, is only with regards to the actual bread itself. We don't have to be lenient, excuse me, we don't have to be stringent with regarding the taste of bread that's, that's absorbed into a vessel. You're allowed to eat from a dish, from a food that has an absorption of pasakum, which is a very fascinating halacha. Practically speaking, now I'm going to give you a, a, a virtual tour, I should say, of how... <coughs> Kosher Pasi Swell pretzels are made. They go to a factory that's certified kosher parv. You don't have to kosher any kalim. It's all kosher parv already. It's not Pasi Swell. Okay, we send the mashkiach down in the morning. The mashkiach goes and lights the fire, turns on the oven, opens the, you know, the computer motherboard and presses whatever, 400 degrees, whatever the temperature it is, they're going to bake at. And the oven, the oven starts because the Jew lit the fire. All bread, all pots, all uh, pretzel products that we baked that day will be pasty straw. So it's very easy to do. We don't have to kosher any kalim. We don't have to do anything. You go to a kosher par factory. You're happy with what you see. It's reliably certified. Mashkiach lights the fire, and all those pretzels are going to be pasty straw. It's a very easy thing to do. And all these Hamish companies, it doesn't matter whichever one you, you choose, they're all made the same way. They go to a factory that's certified kosher par. They send the mashkiach down light the fire so that the pretzels can be pasty straw. And usually the, the pretzels themselves, the various shapes and sizes are just a different die cutting that they have to make that shape. Usually the actual recipe is the same on many of the pretzels themselves. Okay, any questions? How do they kosher all the equipment? That's a very good question. Well, it depends what you're koshering from, but ordinarily to kosher a very large factory, that was not kosher um, can take a long time, could take several days. But one of the things that we look for just to help the process is we look at the piece of equipment, we segregate pieces of equipment that are only used in a cold process. And if they're not liquid and cold, that's one category. If they're liquid and cold, it's another category. If they're hot, heated piece of equipment, we look for equipment that could actually boil themselves out if they cannot pour themselves out and they eat it, it's even more complicated. We have various methods to actually simulate and to bring a boiling experience to vessels that don't have their own heating of their own. For example, if I have a receiving vessel that's going to get boiling hot liquid, but doesn't have any heat of its own, so I'll have to send in boiling hot water into it. I'll use a steam wand, a steam jenny to actually boil the water in while it's actually inside the vessel to be able to make it into a clear reshine. Uh, a boiling vessel of its own. There's different ways you can do it. You can also sometimes use it with a uh, a torch, but that's very hard to do that. You can't do that on water itself. You can sometimes torch, um, you can torch things that are just dry. And uh, with liquid, you usually have to use a steam wand. How often do the factories need to be inspected? 
So factories are inspected on a regular basis, um, usually at least once. Um, you know, most factories are visited once a month. If there's a factory that's producing very simple type of products, sometimes it's going to be visited less often. It could be visited, let's say, every two months or quarterly, or sometimes only once a year. But that's only for products that are very, very stable in terms of how they uh, actually made them with very, very less, very low risk. But products that could have any risk issues, you have to visit them regularly. Any questions about Pasakum? No. Okay. Okay. So now I'm going to turn the page and we're going to start with the Halachas of Bishalakum. When the rabbis made this prohibition, this, they enacted these laws. You have a set of laws. You have pas, which means bread, products. You have bishel, which refers to cooked products. And you have chol of akum, which refers to milk that's milked by a non-Jew. And then you have kvinas akum, which refers to cheese that's made by a non-Jew. These are all rabbinic prohibitions. You're not going to find psukim in the Chomish that discuss these things. These are rabbinic prohibitions, as is enumerated in the Gemara Naveda Zara. The rabbis made these prohibitions, and the primary reason why these prohibitions were put into place with regards to Pas and Bishol is in order to prevent intermarriage. There should be a certain settlement of safeguard between the nations so each nation could be true to their God-given mandate and purpose. Now, as we said a few weeks back, just to refresh our memory again, the, the primary reason why the rabbis instituted and established the laws of Pasakam and Bishalakam are the same as a safeguard against intermarriage. And the secondary reason is that maybe someone's going to actually put some non kosher food into the mix if they're not going to be keeping the laws of kosher. There's a concern about that. But the actual details of what's prohibited in the family of Pasakam and that of Bishalakam differ. With so regards to Pas, we said only bread that's made from the five grains, namely oat wheat, spelled rye or barley, that are turned into a flour substance, that are further turned into a dough substance, that are further baked, those are in the category of pas. But if I take 100% corn flour and I bake it, it's not a question of pas, it's a question of bishel. Anything that's not in the category of pas would then go into the question of bishel. So pas is a leniency that, in a place where they can't get pas Yisrael, there are leniencies with regards to pas palter, even though chasid ma'machber, with regards to Bishol, there's a leniency that anything that's not something you would serve at a king's table, it's not a fancy food. For example, popcorn. You don't serve that at a fancy event. It's considered to be uh, not respectworthy. It's not respectful. Right? It's, it's, it's not food. It's cheap food. That does not have to be made Bishol Yisrael for that reason. But on the other hand, there's a side that's stringent with regards to Bishel, that any food that's not edible raw that you would serve at a king's table must be cooked with the participation of a Jew. And if it's not done that way, the food itself becomes not kosher. And we're going to learn that there's an opinion that says even the vessels themselves become not kosher as, as a result of this issue. I'm sorry? Popcorn is considered to be a snack food. Right. So it would not be a problem. Sure. Now let's let's focus on that for a moment since popcorn is a very important food. Um, <laughs> corn in America is considered to be a, a very uh, a cheap type of uh, commodity. In some countries, corn is more harsher than it are in America. And Eretz Yisrael, I'm told that corn is considered to be more harsher than it is in America. But in America, corn is not considered, it's a Michael Zibor, it's, it's a cheap type of food. And if you look on the industrial level, the cheapest type of sweeteners are from corn, corn, sweet, corn sweeteners, which are very unhealthy, but it's the cheapest life, it's the cheapest food feedstock, so to speak. Um, it's not considered chasha. So if you look at a product, let's say a corn chip, a popcorn, they don't really require bishal yisrael. Someone wants to be machmir and stringent and say, okay, I'm, like, I'm going to make sure my, 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 my corn chips are going to be made bishri so very nice. It's a beautiful thing, but you can't say it's a requirement. 
On the other hand, when we look at something like a potato chip, it's different. Because potatoes, as an actual species of food, as an actual product, a potato itself is chashuv. If I take a potato and I wash it, I cut it in half and I bake it, or I bake it whole in the oven, whatever, I would serve such a thing at a fancy event. It happens all the time. You go to a fancy dinner, they'll serve you potatoes. I'm not going to serve you popcorn for, 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 for your main course. If you do, you'll walk out. Um, okay, so, so potatoes are chashuv. And what about, if, so therefore a potato chip, well, well, one second, if I'm looking at the actual origin of the food, it's got a chashuv, it has chashuv ancestry, yes? Okay, it's, my zayde was chashuv, you know, it was a potato. Uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, what's, what's, the, what's the popcorn going to say? I'm, I'm, my zayde was chashuv, I come from corn. Eh, corn's not chashuv, it's okay. So it's not such a problem. It's a potato chip? So, so I'm saying, um, we're going to discuss this more at length, and I don't want to spoil anybody's favorite snack here either, you know, because potato chips are you know, the four basic food groups in the American diet. Um, but what I'm getting at is that potato chips are a little bit more, um, there's more room to be machmer than with regards to the corn chips. There are people that are machmer only to eat officially soft potato chips. There are leniencies about it, which we'll discuss. But it gets into the discussion. Are we looking at the actual source of the food or the way it's presented right now? Let, let, you know what? We'll, 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 we have a few minutes. Let's just talk about it outside. There's a, a famous machloikis, a famous disagreement, this dispute in halacha about how we view these matters. When it comes to foods, to defining whether or not they have to be bishul yisrael or not, do we go after the origin of the food, the min ha-maichel, in this case the potato, yes? Or do we go after the tzuras ha-maichel, the final presentation of how it's being cooked now? So when you go, if I'm going to go after, after the actual source of the food, the potatoes, okay, potatoes are choshim. I, I, I bake a potato, it's going to be served at a fancy event, right? I make potato wedges, yes, fancy event. I, someone decides to slice the potato and deep fry it and make it into a snack, okay, very nice, you made a few dollars, but it's coming from a potato, it's got good yichas, it's got to be visually yisrael, according to that way of thinking. The other way of thinking is like, no, 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 wait a second. No, 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 no. We're looking at the final product here. Is the final product con be considered to be something that I would serve at a fancy event, at a wedding, at a fancy, at a state dinner? Potato chips? No, 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 you wouldn't do that. Wouldn't fly. So then you're like, okay, so it doesn't have to be officially a stroll, according to that way of thinking. But it's a machloikis. When it comes to corn chips, on the other hand, corn v'chatechila, even as a source food, as a min, as an actual, as an actual source of a feedstock is not really chosher, so therefore it's much more lenient than with, with regards to potato chips. Is there also the food that actually goes in the ground versus above the ground? That does not come into play with regards to these halachas. These halachas, the two principles are, is it edible raw? Or would it be served at a king's table? Those are the two qualifications that have to be in place. Meaning that it has to be not edible raw, it has to be something that you would serve at a king's table to qualify for the need to be officially a stroll. For kosher potato chips, what kind of oil are they usually deep fried? Probably the least healthy like oil. oil. The least. The, no, they'll use like the soybean oil or any kind of vegetable oil. But soybeans are also very cheap. Yes. You're asking about the oil itself? Yeah. Okay, the oil itself. Because the potato takes on the flavor of the oil. Yes, you're right. But the oil itself is. Um, Soy is cheaper than corn now. Okay, I hear that. Um, the oil, it's, you're asking why the oil does not have to be made by Yisrael. The oil is refined, goes through a degumming process. Um, the oil is not ready to eat. Until it gets used with other foods, so it's not considered. It's not the derech to eat it that way. It's not the norm. People don't just say, you know. But if the potato is cooked in, let's say, non-kosher soybean oil, something like that, then like it's not kosher for other reasons. Yes, right. you're right. Because the potato takes on the. Yes, of yes, the you're right. But but the oil itself, as a, as a substance by itself, you don't eat on its own. Okay, it's ten o'clock. 
So we're going to have to pause here. Afrelechim, rest of Hanukkah. And have a good rest of your week. And the Shkodesh, yes, the Shkodesh Davis. Holy times, holy times. You know, my father, I told you this last time, my father came to the Rebbe 62 years ago, Asura Betavis. And when he came, the Rebbe said that they should have one of the Bachrim take him along and, and, and show him around. And it was, he came in Chatan, it was during the time the Rebbe was saying Haftoira. The Bachrim didn't want to leave, they didn't want to miss it. So the Bachrim had to discuss amongst himself who's going to go. Rabbi Zayling all the went. My father came to the dormitory, it was on Eastern Parkway, one block away, 682 Eastern Parkway. My grandma, I told you so, my grandmother came in with my father, and she cried. Because she was in my father's university, in a nice, whatever, nice foundation. She cried, and then she, um, she asked one of the people that was taking my father all along, an English bacha, she said to him, how come they have to have lockers here? You're all religious Jews, you, you trust each other, you're not going to steal from each other, why do you need lockers? So they told her to give every person a sense of personal space, and she was satisfied with the answer. Kena Sarabatevis, yeah. Yeah. Then my father, then the Rebbe told my father, for the first three months, don't ask yourself what you're doing here because you won't be able to answer the question. Then the Rebbe said, for the first six months, don't ask yourself the question. And a few times, if my father, the Rebbe saw my father, the Rebbe saw my father walking on Eastern Park, the corner of Brooklyn, the Rebbe stopped him and said, How's it going? Ayeka. How's it going? Okay, I have to stop. Yes, thank you. I just wanted to remind you of, hi, welcome back. Um, it's Rosh Chodesh today, so just a reminder about the davening. If you're if you're up to it, there's also in addition to the, in, in addition to the fact that we've been adding Hallel until now, we also had Rosh Chodesh. How's it going? Yeah. Which reminds me of the joke. What's the cow's favorite fila? Musa. Musa. Yeah. <laughs> All right. After you look him, I got Chaydish.